So we're gonna, just going to be talking about uh, what learning disabilities are and some accommodations and how to get them. Uh, David, if you want to turn to the next slide. All right, so um, comes from um, the um, Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. Um, so um, it's defined as follows. Specific learning disabilities mean a disorder that in one or more of the basic psychological processes involved in understanding or using language spoken or written that may manifest itself in the imperfect ability to listen, think, speak, read, write, spell, or to do mathematical calculations, including conditions such as perpetual disabilities, brain injuries, uh, minimal brain dysfunction, dyslexia, and development, so as asphasia. And can you uh, flip to the next slide for me, David? So um, when talking about what learning disabilities are, we have to be specific on what doesn't uh, uh, qualify for learning disabilities. Um, so learning problems that are the result of things that aren't learning disabilities. However, also sometimes those same like cultural issues and um, problems that these people are facing can force them to also exhibit um, the symptoms of other uh, learning disabilities that special education might actually help with. So it's sort of a double-edged sword there, but especially uh, my mom was talking about she had in her classrooms a lot of like especially uh, black male children would be misdiagnosed and put in these uh, programs like a lot uh, comparatively to to other demographics mm -hmm. um so just something interesting to think about there all right thank you david are right, you go to the next slide now all right so um some productions under the um id uh Individuals with Disabilities Education Act is anyone with a learning disability is entitled to free, appropriate public education, and the school must find and evaluate the students uh, thought to have disabilities at no cost to the family. This doesn't really apply at the university level, more as like a high, uh, at the high school and like elementary level. However, this is something that I just like to include when talking about um, um, the Individuals with Disability and Education Act. And having a diagnosis doesn't always necessarily mean that you qualify for certain accommodations um, and schools are tr uh, do try to put you in what is called the least restrictive environment which is um is uh, an interesting thing that we talk a lot about in my sped classes and that rowan has some like notes on as well uh so basically what i'm saying the least restrictive environment that means uh, schools genuinely try to put you in um levels closer to general education as much as possible because that is what's said to be the least restrictive environment. Yeah, this is this is another weird mixed bag because mm -hmm. uh, sometimes this line in this this law is used as um, an excuse to mainstream uh, kids that don't necessarily won't ex necessarily do well in the mainstream. Um, but you know, it's cheaper, it's easier, um, and it's what happens a lot. Sometimes this is used to actually make. Um, classrooms in which, you know, they have uh, teachers specifically for these special education uh, students in that specific subject, um, but it can go either way and it's it's used weirdly sometimes. Oh, 100%, yeah. All right, so I'm going to go over some different types of learning disabilities now. And so before we go over the different uh, types of learning disabilities, I'm going to go over like some general like things that you're going to notice with learning disabilities. So you're going to see a lot of reading problems, problems with uh, writing, underachievement of math, uh, problems socializing, and low self-esteem is a really common thing just because it's it's really hard to feel like proud of yourself when you're, when you're struggling so much in school in ways that you feel like you shouldn't. And the really thing that's important to note is the is how common it is to have ADHD while uh, while having learning disabilities. It's in fact it's like more it's more it's more weird if you don't have ADHD and you have like a learning disability, just because they they kind of intersect so much. Um, I know a lot of people also categorize ADHD as a learning disability. Yeah, well. yeah, no, that, that that's another thing too. Um. But yeah, uh, it is, it's super common, especially if you have ADHD, it's also very common for you to just also have something else. 
So yeah, hundred percent. You rarely just have ADHD. It's a buddy. It's a buddy. <laughs> ADHD is a buddy. All right, David, next slide, please. All right, so the first one we'll talk about is dyslexia. Dyslexia is specifically a learning disability in reading. Uh, the most common things you're going to notice when you have dyslexia is trouble reading at a good pace without mistakes. They may also have a hard time with reading comprehension, spelling, and writing. So here are like, the main ways that you're going to see dyslexia manifest. It's good, uh, with like problems in grammar, reading comprehension, reading fluency, sentence structure, in-depth writing, memory problems, and stress. Uh, stress may sound like a weird symptom of dyslexia, but it makes a lot of sense when you think about it. For example, I have dyslexia, and one thing that, like, I hate reading in class. I always flip around how sentences are worded, and I just misread things. I mispronounce it. And so, like, I'm often, like, really str more stressed out than my peers in, like, the classroom environment when we're doing, like, popcorn reading. It's just an absolute nightmare. Um, a fun fact, um, cause again, my mom taught sped a while and also my, my brother has dyslexia. Um, and you have a really, what was, could you, would you mind mentioning your internship? It's really cool. Oh yeah. I also, it be perfect for, for, about it. I work for a, a school that specifically is for dyslexic children. It's from like elementary to junior high level. Mm. Um, anyway, but, uh, apparently a very good like trick, it's not always but it's like often like the easiest one to see um if a child is having trouble um realizing that things rhyme uh especially when reading if they don't get the rhymes that's apparently a very that's a symptom of dyslexia so, so like, another common one too is like is is like you're gonna like you'd see like in like a young kid's writing they confuse using what when and where like but like use them interchangeably which is really interesting. I, I did that a lot as a kid. That was that was apparently like a really common dyslexia thing. All right, next slide, David. All right, dyscalculia is a learning disability in math. It's all, dyscalculia is not super well known about. So whenever like people are talking about dyscalculia, they, they usually just call it like, oh, it's math dyslexia because that's like a really simple way to understand it. It involves problems in, you know, understanding math, uh, learning math-related concepts, and performing accurate math calculations. And some ways that uh, dyscalculia manifest is, it's really interesting is in the sense that, like, it has, you have a lot of problems like judging time, speed, and distance, and with, like, Roman numerals as well. And so it's, like, hard to understand how, like, the letter... Uh, represents five and how like the word five are the same and they they, they don't they both uh are both like the same amount and dysgraphia is another as it's another learning disability that people don't know as much about um it's it's learning disability involving problems with transcription which is stuff uh so like you have problems like handwriting typing and spelling and like the main sign of dysgraphia usually is messy handwriting, but it can also be caused by a number of things. And Rowan uh, and I were talking about this before, and they had a they had a note about that. What was it, Rowan? Uh, heart. Um, uh, my mom was talking about it. Uh, she says, you know, if like especially uh, really like bright children will have extremely messy handwriting because their brain is going faster than their hands. So. I, probably certain types of messy handwriting can be more attributed to dysgraphia, but it's it's not always like a surefire like. Yeah, when it comes to like dysgraphia. messy handwriting, it's not just like oh, it, it looks bad. It's like um, when pa paper always has like lines, and when you're when you have dysgraphia, you have the you have a much harder time keeping your writing in the lines, and that's more kind of what they're looking for when you're looking for like messy handwriting that can be attributed to dysgraphia. Um, so the main ways that you see dysgraphia manifests is like forming letters, the way you space letters correctly on the page, writing in a straight line, making letters the correct size, holding, uh, holding the paper with one hand while writing with the other, um, and how you control the pencil. It honestly, like how you hold the pencil too in itself is like a really big sign. And, and that also transfers over to like having problems holding utensils and stuff. So a lot of, and because of that, a lot of people with dysgraphia are a lot slower in learning, like, different motor skills. For example, like, learning how to tie your shoes sometimes comes a lot slower if you have dysgraphia. 
And this also goes for like posture and writing. And the last um, learning disability that uh, we're talking about is the oral is oral slash written language disorder. Uh, so this is specifically um, problems with that impeach like your ability to speak and written comprehensions. It's just kind of like it affects the individual's understanding of what they've read and um, of the spoken language. Um, struggles understanding or expressing language, trouble ordering their words and understanding syntax and trouble understanding encoded meanings. An example that we included is people with this learning disability often like see the phrases, the, the blanket is on the baby versus the baby is on the blanket. Like it's really easy for those to be the same thing to them because um, of just how they encode the sentences. All right, so um, here are some accommodations and how you can be found at eligible. So what are accommodations? Accommodations are modifications or changes to the learning environment, instruction, or assessment that allows individuals with a disability to, to better assess the content and, have, and be able to succeed. So when it comes to accommodations, there are really three types of accommodations. <laughs> the first type that I'm going to be talking about is environmental accommodations. These are environmental accommodations are primarily used to uh, to help students with learning disabilities uh, uh, cope with like the more like social and like um, environment aspects of of learning. For uh, a really good and common one is um, different testing environments. Um, sometimes. Um, when you have learning disabilities, you notice that uh, your peers are able to finish your, te their, your test much faster than you, and so you constantly are like, oh my gosh, I have to catch up. So a good way to help with this is, to, is when, they're, uh, when someone with like a learning disability is testing, they usually move them into another room so they don't have this, uh, this fear of trying to catch up with other students uh, as well. And uh, the second type of of accommodations and a structural type of accommodation. This is an accommodation of how um, the, of lessons and material are presented. Um, an example of an instructional accommodation is um, when, you, when you have something like dysgraph, uh, dysgraphia or dyslexia, taking notes can be much harder for you. So uh, during instruction periods, uh, you are instead given, you can instead be given like an outline of the notes uh, to help you follow through and make sure that you're not uh, missing out as much. And then the third um, example of an accommodation would be an assessment accommodation. Um, this is just a change to how um, a student is accessed. This is an extremely common example of this is extended time. So like uh, you're given more time to write if you take longer to write or allowing um, a student in certain cases to do the test orally instead of written. And um, at Texas State, uh, these are like the common accommodations that are on the Office of Disabilities websites uh, that um, that are most often given out. Um, these accommodations are extended time on, on test, uh, reduced interaction environments, note taking assistance. Um, that's note taking assistances are usually like uh, people in class and uh, students in classes are are sometimes um, asked at the beginning if they would mind like providing their notes to the teachers that way if any student needs them they can hand these notes out another uh and some other ones are alternative formal test assistive technology special groups for early registration uh preferral seating in the classroom uh sign language interpreting services and captioning uh speech to text services so how do you qualify? Uh, when using the federal definition to identify students with learning disabilities, uh, most states require these three criteria. The first one is a severe discrepancy between uh, the student's intellectual ability and their academic achievement. The second being an, ex an exclusion criteria. The student's difficulties are not the result of another known condition that can cause learning disabilities. And three, a need for special education services. Oh, I can. Uh, for. Uh, the reason why uh, you need to qualify for like specifically learning disabilities is you can be doing really bad in a class because you just had a stroke and obviously you'd still get accommodations for this, but you wouldn't be put through special education for that because 
it's not going to be like a permanent aspect to your life the way that like dyslexia would be and they would work with the school would probably work with you very different if, if it's a result of like something like that rather than dyslexia does that make sense okay sweet thank, thank you for asking me to specify i want to i want to add something here that my mom was mentioning um because she was she's using this like number while she's talking to me she's good um they're labeled as like 504 but it's yes. it's apparently uh, at least at the school she's worked at like physical disabilities including just like temporary injuries and stuff we're all like lumped together also with dyslexia uh for accommodations yeah that i re- i remember reading a bit about that they some some aren't and some aren't it's really weird how it's done this is just the federal definition so it it's really weird because each state is done differently 504 i believe is specifically for texas mm. yeah i, I thought it was just strange that they, they like it was physical disabilities and also dyslexia um <laughs> yeah that is a very strange yeah. grouping <laughs> yeah because like other um other like other special education needs were grouped together differently you know that is that is very that is very interesting and um for um some testing that's commonly used um for assessing if students have learning disabilities or not include um standardized intelligent and achievement tests criteria reference tests um curriculum based measurements they're called which are commonly referred to as c uh cm CBMs and direct and daily measurements. All right, so how do you get accommodations for your classes at Texas State? Um, So the first thing you're gonna wanna do is fill out uh, the confidential student information form and you can find it using our our link tree. David's updated it to include a link to the Office of Disabilities website. And then the second step is documentation. You're gonna to have to provide um, documentation of the disability or disabilities to the office. You can uh, you can either fax it or upload them to the Texas State File Transfer Link, which will be sent to your email after completing the CSI. So when I filed with the ODS, I'm, I don't know if this is like normal, but it was like, I, all I had was, like I just had, um, or maybe I filled out a file. I don't know. I just had like my uh, the person who diagnosed me like just email them that yes. Oh, uh, this yeah. Is they, 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 that person took care of your documentation for oh, you. Okay, okay, okay. So like you, the person who diagnosed you while diagnosing you, they made documentation, then they sent it in on your behalf. Uh, yeah. Be, before I before I came to college, my dad and I uh, took a trip up here to visit with the Office of Disability Services to make sure that we could give them all the necessary paperwork. And uh, like they gave me the uh, and when the school year started, my freshman year, uh, they just gave me the usual accommodation paperwork to fill out. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, to ask the office to request this information on your behalf. They will provide you with the consent of release uh, of confidential information. You can find this on their website. And then once it's completing, you can send it to their email. And then after that, uh, they're just going to review the uh, your need for accommodations and make sure um, that uh, the support services base uh, uh, will be based on your disability and documentation. It might take up to 30 disability uh, 30 business days for ODS to review um, student submitted documentation. Another thing I do want to note along with this is sometimes people think like, oh, I can't really apply for accommodations till next semester because I forgot to do it at the beginning. You can you can uh, apply for accommodations at any point in uh, the semester. Uh, next, uh, next slide, David. And then step four is a review meeting. ODS will notify you uh, to schedule an accommodations review meeting via email after you submit your documentation. So um, after uh, the next thing I do want to talk about is the concept of universal accommodations. Uh, universal accommodations are accommodations that any student can utilize uh, for uh, for state assessments, regardless of eligibility, without uh, changing what is being measured by the assessment. One thing I do want to note is not all teachers do universal accommodations. I've actually really only had 
one professor advertised they do universal accommodations. This is kind of like a, a new thing that I, I've never heard this concept discussed until I got like later in my SPED classes. So this is something that like more and more teachers are like starting to look into. Um, would you mind uh, flipping to the next slide? So some examples of universal accommodations is they'll allow any student to type up uh, assignments they're supposed to be handwritten. Um, uh, we're opposed to like certain classrooms. They only let some students bring in laptops while like saying like, we don't want you to bring in technology. Our other example would be if, if one student reaches out about needing some extra time for an assignment, they'll extend the deadline for everyone. And um, another example would be having a copy of notes that any student can request at any time and are like having a class note taker that will take notes that can be accessed by anyone in the classroom. So why should we establish universal accommodations? Getting a per, uh, professional diagnosis is honestly not an option for every student. It's expensive, it takes a long time, and it's just not an option for everyone. And having universal accommodations in place will help not only undiagnosed students, but neurotypical students can even use this because sometimes you just fall behind and like having an, a copy of notes or being able to type them just will really make the difference in how well you're able to do in class. So what accommodations uh, would you find helpful in the classroom? Universal note taker would definitely help. Yeah, I, I feel like that's like a really helpful one because like sometimes not even like having problem taking notes, but sometimes you do miss classes for good reason. Just having like a way to access notes quickly really help. Yeah, especially as like someone with undiagnosed ADHD or someone with ADHD. Um, like that's not on our accommodations list. Yeah. Um, which kind of sucks because that's like the big thing in ADHD is like it's very hard to pay attention and I'll drift in and out of a class. And I'd love exactly. especially some teachers are really weird about like giving their PowerPoints and stuff too. Oh yeah, they're would... weirdly protective, which I understand yeah. because an accommodation I have is I'm allowed to like record lectures, but like some teachers get really uncomfortable by that because it's like their intellectual property and they're like, make sure no one sees this. And it's just, I don't know. I just feel like a lot of these things should be more accessible. Yeah. Especially, yeah, it's, it's difficult for me to, to like be able to take all these notes the entire time. So. Yeah, why yeah, is that not like for access. people with ADHD? Because like zoning <laughs> in and out. Yeah. That's very bizarre. I don't know. I feel like. Yeah, you know, especially I feel like a lot of the ADHD ones, all the ones that they offer, I think are good, but none of them are useful towards me. So I never yeah. end up using my accommodation letter because I don't actually need any of the accommodations that they offer. I do need other ones, but they're not offered. Yeah, what accommodations do they not have for ADHD that like you think would be really helpful? Um, definitely like being able to have access to notes, um, mm -hmm. lectures, like mm -hmm. um, slides, that sort of thing. Uh, extended uh, deadlines would be really nice. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, God. Like, a teacher, I've had a couple teachers who have done that where at the end of the, the semester, they're like, by the way, if there's any homework that you didn't do, you can submit that, like, before the final or whatever. And that was a godsend for my grade because I am, I never remember what day it is. I never, mm -hmm. like... So mm. even though I write down a hundred to-do lists and I write it all down in my planners, I don't remember what day it is half the time. So then I don't know how many assignments I've missed just because I forgot what day it was. And oh, that was due today. I do think, I think that's a good approach of, you know, there's deadlines, but then anything can be turned in later. Cause that's been a yeah. problem for me, especially with yeah. the pandemic is that I will forget that something happened. And then they are like no late work ever if you don't turn it in by the minute it's gone and it has just tanked my grades oh 100 yeah, yeah. What one, you gonna my, say? one of my accommodations is that i am allowed to have one additional uh block period to finish an assignment depend and uh it is but it is it, it has to be negotiable with the uh, professor depending on how big the project is mm. and so like i can't for example uh 
to take an online exam a block period after it's supposed to be due. You know what I mean? No, I know exactly what you mean. I feel like, I don't know if this is just my experience, but I feel like even when they do give you, like, an accommodation of extended timing, it's always, like, there's so many, like, buts or, like, conditions attached onto it. It's almost yeah. worthless. They're like, I, I can't, uh, their usual excuse I've heard is, hey, I can't play any favorites this semester. And you're like, please, <laughs> just do this for everyone then. <laughs> yeah. So, and... now to the next question then, what are y'all's thoughts on universal accommodations? Please. God, please. please. It is so hard getting diagnoses, and like, sometimes it just feels bad to have to go to the like i don't i have actually a couple teachers that i need to email to ask like mm. hey um can just to let you know like you know that sort of yeah heads up email that you yeah that you're like supposed to send. i still haven't sent that to like several of my teachers just because it feels so bad to sometimes be like hey so occasionally my brain is shit can you please like help me out a little buddy Especially yeah. you never know if it's going to be one of those professors that's like totally chill and running to help or a professor that's like doesn't really believe you and is very judgmental about it. Oh, yes. 100%. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and it's yeah. like the, the guessing game that you have to do is like, well, either this teacher is going to be really nice and help me out or I don't know, maybe they'll be middle road or they're going to just act like they hate me because of this for some reason because sometimes teachers just do that and it's like, do I really want to have to send that email and then deal with that la later or do I just want to fail the class? Yeah. I oh, sorry, you can go, David. Yeah, especially yeah. if every professor, one, like I think it's a huge problem that um, professors don't really get training on how to deal with a lot of learning disabilities, um, yeah. which would be heavily useful. But like having the like set rules by the university that the professors know and are familiar with that they have to do would really like ease the load, I think, on everyone. I, I yeah. agree. Well, I think too, a thing that I've really hear is common, I've heard a lot of y'all mention it too, is when you have to get uh, accommodations, you have to go like with the letter to each uh, teacher and just so many people don't want to go through the letter process to the point to where so many people that are registered with ODS don't actually get their accommodations because they're, they're offered about going to apply for it. Yeah, it's really like, it's a weird time. And I don't know, like, uh, I mean, we aren't going to a private university, but private universities are able to kind of bypass some of the legal stuff. Are they like, really? It's awful. Yeah, I don't know. They're, they're like, not. They're not required to fall. So, like a like a fi like uh, I can't remember if it's five five hundred four plans or IEPs that are like legally binding contracts, like between you and like the university. That um, private universities don't have that obligation because they're not federally funded. That's 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 pretty awful. Wow. Yeah, and I think. I can't speak from my own experience, but I know people who have said that they've dealt with uh, professors who would say something like, oh, who would like, when, they, uh, when they're trying to explain to the professor, you know, like, hey, I have ADHD, can you please go a little slower for me or do this or that? And they're like, oh, please, your generation all is ADHD. And... Uh, my friends would say, like, I have never been more tempted to say OK Boomer in my life. <laughs> yeah, because I, I definitely think that universal accommodations would force their hand for, you know, ableism purposes. Yep. And, you know, normally those professors are also not great even to their non-neurodivergent kids. Oh, yeah, like, I had to deal with a uh, professor who forced his students to turn everything in by hand and refused to use Canvas or Tracks, and oh. it, it was a huge inconvenience to everyone. I've had professors that didn't know I was dyslexic, like, like message me, they're like, hey, I know I require everyone to turn this in by hand, but I just hate your handwriting. Can you please, like, oh turn it? Oh my god. Which is really... I... Sorry. I had, a, no, you I had a, teacher, a teacher in high school who, um... There was a kid in my class who, class who had uh, dysgraphia, 
and like the school still wanted him to take notes so he had to sit there and write notes that he couldn't even read and the teacher couldn't read because it was a requirement that he still write them like it's like crazy mm -hmm. i want to i'm not sorry you uh, I was gonna say just just real quick, uh, make sure you fill out the little form that I put in the voice chat, uh, mm -hmm. so that we know that you were here. Thank you. This is gonna, uh, be, one thing I... this is gonna be a lot, my last question, then I have to bounce. Uh, could uh, so I'm a bit still a bit confused. Uh, can someone please help explain the difference between dyslexia and dysgraphia? Oh yes. Okay. So um, dysgraphia is more along the problem of like trans uh transcribing stuff so uh, that's that's more focused on like having problems writing uh writing stuff down um for example like you can have the words in your head but that's not what you transcribe because you just mix up the words in your head that doesn't mean you have any problems reading particularly which is where dyslexia comes in does that help yeah. clear it up at all yes thank you very much oh okay, no. um in voice chat i'll i'll post um some photo examples of what dysgraphia looks like. Thank you. Oh, sweet. Thank you so much, Tabby. But uh, I please had... keep in mind that um, a lot of these like to hold hands and uh, like to yes. both happen. Dyslexia and dysgraphia are girlfriends. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I had a friend in high school who, uh, he had dysgraphia and I remember um, we had teachers who would, ins who would still insist that he had to they would insist that every assignment had to be handwritten. Um, so he would just like go to me and other people's like, Hey, I will pay you. Like so sometimes he'd offer payment and sometimes he'd just be like, Hey, please write this down for me. So he'd just kind of like voice annotate an essay to me or to one of our other friends. It really, it yeah, really sucks. So how unwilling professors are to give some, like, and teachers are to give some like, really simple accommodations because how, tis great, cause, like, I understand, like, why some professors would prefer you to turn things through, like, turnin.com because that makes, like, grading easier. But grading handwritten work is much harder than grading typed work, even. So they'd rather yeah. put more effort on anyone than take an accommodation, which is really weird to me. When I was young, uh, my mom strong armed my schools into letting her uh, letting me dictate uh, a certain assignments to her because i was really slow at writing and typing hmm. and i on the one hand it felt really good but on the other hand like uh like my teachers kind of guilted me about it saying like oh you're not actually putting in the work you're not uh learning anything from this that's awful. Yeah. All right, well, that's all I can uh, say today. Bye, y'all. Hi, Kate. Thank you so much for coming and sharing. No problem. All right, so our, our next question would be, how do you guys think that Texas State could be more helpful towards your disabilities? As, as I mentioned before, like, I really think some more training, um, for mm -hmm. professors would be very useful because I feel like a lot of professors don't even know what this stuff is or how it works, you know, and yeah. especially just giving them some really simple stuff of like, here's what you can do, especially like, here's how it exhibits in college age students, um, not necessarily just like children um, so that yeah. they can adjust their, their teaching style to be more accommodating. I, I completely agree. I feel like back with the concept of universal accommodations that um, they could really like look at like what is is like a good chunk of like how things get presented to students with learning disabilities could be useful to literally everyone in the classroom. I feel like learning what works best for like students who have the most hard time learning and applying that to the classroom would you would see a lot more success. I feel like Texas State should really look at other universities and what they're doing, like even outside of the United States, because like I went to a college outside of the United States and had like the easiest time getting accommodations and the accommodations were like better than anything I could ever imagine getting at Texas State or any other university like that I've been to, like just like the things I was provided, like I never knew that it, 
I could get accommodations in the ways that I could. Like they gave me like, they approved me for 50 to a hundred hours of free tutoring and like provided wow. me a tutor for every class that had already, they had already taken the class and passed it with an A. And that person like sat in on my classes and took my notes for me. Like anything I could ask, it was provided. What, what country was this? Canada. Oh, of course it was. <laughs> yeah. So like, I just feel like Texas State like should really look at other universities like and what they're doing and what's working because what they're doing is not good enough. I, I agree. I didn't even know that was possible. Um, I will say, I know for uh, a lot of places, especially public schools, but probably public universities as well, some of the stuff that stops them from the um, accommodations is budget. Um, yeah. Being not funded or being not funded in the right areas um, sort of bogs down a lot of these processes. Yeah. I as a as a history person, I guess that kind of slides into a little bit of political science, but it's not really my thing. Most of what they are doing is only because they're getting money for it. Like that's a lot of the reason why private schools don't have to do stuff is like the schools that are getting the funding are getting more funding specifically to have these programs. Not a huge point, just like no, they, yeah. they are getting yeah. funding yeah. for it. I was just thinking about it. Yeah. Sometimes I ponder. I do. I do definitely think, you know, even if we don't, if it, even if it's not like federal laws put in place, like just some more Texas state rules and like ruling for the university would be helpful. Because have you ever had like those professors that give you a, an assignment and expect like a paper in like one or two days? Oh yeah. I feel like that shouldn't I feel like you should get like at least three days for every assignment previously. I, know, I, like, I need the day the assignment is assigned. I need a day to emotionally think about the assignment, mm -hmm. then I need the time to do it. Especially I... if you throw it in during a busy time. Ugh. Mm -hmm. An accommodation or something that would be a lot more helpful for at least me is I don't think attendance policies should be as strict as they are. Um like, I'm a person who, if I am having a really bad day, I can't go to class. I can't, and, like, I can do the work for the class, but, like, if it wasn't for Zoom calls, like, for Zooms, even Zooms are kind of difficult to get into. Oh, my mic's fucking up. Sorry. Um, Can y'all hear me? I can hear you. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, like I really feel like, um, especially like for me, like I've had a, like a rough, like two weeks to where like, I didn't attend a couple lectures and it's like, well, if these, if it wasn't for like COVID, I would have like, they would have taken off so many points on my grades. <laughs> like it's, 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 I think it's bullshit. Except for a lot of kids who, um, I don't know. It's just really hard to just, is every like every week <laughs> yeah i i agree like changes in the attendance would be useful especially like letting you make it up in some way you know i don't i It'd don't really nice. see i don't really see the point like me personally in mandatory attendance if you're still doing well in the class because if you i don't know that's that's all I, my aunt, she, I don't actually remember what she went to college for. I just know that she was in some kind of sorority. So I know it was a, I don't know. But she told me that she had a class at one point where she did not attend a single class, but still made a B because they didn't have like the, uh, like the attendance tied to the grades for that class. She still made like a high B, even though she did not go to a single lecture. And God, I wish that could be me. Yeah, that sounds amazing. I've had professors who have told me if I miss one class, regardless of if I bring any kind of like doctor's note or anything, that they'll fail me. Okay. Huh? Sorry, there's just a large amount of noise coming from you. All right, my girlfriend is bringing in a giant bag of.
yeah no i i i agree i that gets kind of complicated with some stuff but yeah if they're able to make accommodations for that or if they're forced to make accommodations for that it would be nice oh i have additional i have another thing i want why are there not captions on literally everything like i want cap I like that. because like my brain uh doesn't process like sound if i'm not reading it and i know like a lot of things do have like captions but like i mean youtube automated captions are awful um zoom captions can be helpful but i zoom captions captions for me don't work unless i watch the like recording of the zoom but i don't know i want captions on everything yeah i know because some sometimes you get those online lectures with captions and sometimes you don't um, I know they're forced to if there is a deaf or hard of hearing student in class, but I think they don't really pay attention to a lot of other auditory processing issues, um, which I think kind of folds back into the idea of universal accommodations. Um, but yeah, cap more captioning services would be very nice because I know a lot of places they have like they'll hire students just to go do that. Um, which well, I think Texas. Is Texas State actually has captionists that are on campus all the time, but they only have them for hard of hearing students. Yeah. I think that should be expanded. All right, is there any additional thoughts or anything that else that anyone wants to share? Yeah. Um, so I've been quite certain that I have dyscalculia for like, Oh God, I can't count. I think six years. I tried to keep. Um, well, that might be a sign. <laughs> yeah, um, <laughs> but it's weird in that, like, anytime, like, especially I, my sister was the main person to kind of, like when she was still living with my family. She was, I was like, hey, you know, you should ask someone about this because look at all these, uh, like the list of symptoms, and you fit every single one, and it's weird because it's like. I like I'm I failed uh college algebra last semester I'm retaking it but I don't know there I've always struggled with math and science because that the only reason I passed all of my math and science classes in high school is because I cheated on almost everything um say that with my full chest but like there's this weird amount of shame attached to it where it's like I've had people kind of call me stupid for years and even though that hurts it's like I'm used to it, and I almost don't want to go through the hassle of going to a doctor about it because it's almost like, well, I'm used to just thinking of myself as stupid. So what do I do? Like, what does that mean if I have to make this whole adjustment to how I think about myself? Yeah, no, I, I do yeah. get that a lot. I feel like dyscalculia especially is really underdiagnosed, and it's really hard to, like, I don't know, it's just... I feel like there's definitely, like, a lot of shame attached to, like, having learning disabilities in the sense that, like, it's just, you are called stupid a lot, uh, people do talk down to you a lot, and it's, like, and it's definitely, we I don't know, I, I do, I do sympathize with that a lot. Yeah, because I was, I was talking about this earlier in general, but, like, yeah, it's, 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 it's disheartening, and it's, it's strange, but, like, pretty much everyone with learning disabilities has like this huge amount of guilt associated with it. And it's both, you know, sort of societal, familial, uh, friends, the school system, like all of us sort of like contribute to giving like these children and, and adults like this huge amount of guilt just by existing. Um, and that's sort of like, I don't know why we're pushing, I guess, for, for a lot of this advocacy uh, to help sort of like add the you know, to alleviate sort of that. But yeah, it, it's kind of, it's weird to like sort of reframe it. I would say if you go in for the, like whenever I've gotten diagnosed with anything, it's been such a relief, you know? It's been such a like, oh, now I can reframe this all in my brain so that I don't feel so bad about everything. Oh, yeah. I think the problem and, is how learning, oh, sorry, you can go, Jory. Oh, well, I um I was just gonna say it also feels weird because it's gotten I was in two very severe car accidents one my sophomore year and then one uh it was a little bit after 
COVID started, so um, a, a year ago, I think. Um, and things have gotten worse since those car accidents. Mm-hmm. Uh, so part of me is like, oh, God, do I have to go to a doctor and be like, hey, I think my brain got joggled. Because then part of it's like, it was like that before, but now is it worse? Is it worse because of that? Or is it worse because I'm going to college? Like, ugh. Yeah. I don't know. Um, I know it's super expensive to go even do any of that stuff, but it might be nice to have at least. To have and to hold. Yeah. Always, always. But also, we, we respect self-diagnoses in this in this club. Self-diagnoses are very valid. I mean, uh, next week, I actually have my first appointment to hopefully get diagnosed with ADHD, and I'm going to try and bring up the dyscalculia thing uh, sure, yeah. during that. Oh, cool. that's, ex- that's, that's really exciting. Ooh. Oh. Good luck. Have fun. <laughs> be yourself have fun <laughs> alright is there any other comments before we wrap up the meeting um one last thing I was gonna say is like also like your ability to get accommodations and stuff like and like how helpful the professors are I feel like really depends on what your degree is in because mm-hmm. when I was doing like basic kind of things and I was like doing like all the you know biology and all these other things like it, my professors were like they didn't give a shit at all but like when I started getting into like my actual degree like thank goodness I'm studying social work because like it's all about like advocating for like vulnerable populations and so like I feel like now that I'm in like just the social work part of it like I have an easier time because my professors are like knowledgeable and educated and like they always are like providing captioning and like being willing to like give me little extensions here and there and stuff so like i don't know i feel like it really depends and like that's unfortunate for people who are in fields that aren't as accommodating that's a very good point yeah, yeah. I, yes. I, only teacher that, the only teacher that does provide universal accommodations is one of my sped teachers so that doesn't really surprise me to hear yeah especially i feel like a lot of like the like the professors who teach the like general classes that everybody has to take especially since the classes are often so large they're like much more kind of like uncaring yeah and yeah it's it so depends on like because I've, I've had really good luck in like the honors college that people have been usually pretty accommodating um but that's not like, not necessarily true for like other types of classes yeah, I was going to say about that actually sorry Go for it. Okay, so before I switched to psychology, I was a pre-med major, and this is also simultaneously when I had my mental breakdown in September. And so after I had gone to the hospital, I had to email every single one of my teachers who had a general class or like something that I was like failing because of attendance because I wasn't there. And almost all of them, regardless of what class it was, were pretty good about it, all things considered. They're just like, your health comes first. We're going to extend deadlines so you can catch up, and then you can do this. So I was just like, oh, that's kind of nice, actually. Why can't it just be like that for everybody all the time? Yeah, I feel like that sort of goes into that, you know, that idea of, like, like, I I struggle a lot, but, like, I I didn't necessarily have, like, any, like, like, I was never, like, hospitalized or anything. So I feel like you, like they respond to like more dramatic events, but like just general struggling, a lot of professors don't respond to. Um, I'm glad that they were so accommodating. That's great. I also don't email my professors a lot, which is also on me. But <laughs> yeah, me neither. There, there's nothing that like horrifies me more than emailing my professors. I hate it. That's you know maybe I just yeah, have I social it. anxiety, but I hate it. <laughs> yeah, I just like I don't want to be perceived at all. Like I want to get an A, but I also don't want you to talk to me ever. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Like talk to my professor? Who am I? No. Um Yeah, because I know a lot of them are accommodating if you like actually talk to them. Which is again why I'm pushing for universal accommodation so I don't have to talk to them. <laughs> yeah, that that might, might be a motive of mine as well, but Yeah. 
but that was that was a that was a good thing to bring up. Thank you, Maddie. Yeah, I really appreciated that insight. Any other any other thoughts that anyone wants to share? Just that, like, it. I I've been like talking to my therapist about this sort of stuff. And my therapist been like, "Hey, part of the reason why you should definitely get diagnosis for accommodation purposes." And this meeting was great, just because every time that's been brought up, I've always been like, "Well, I don't know what the heck I could get," you know, because it's just like it feels like such an abstract thing. Yeah, that it, it's neat to hear you guys say like, "Oh, well, here are some things you can do if you uh, need accommodations," because most of the time it's just like, "Okay, accommodations. What does that mean? What what are you supposed to do?" Well, if you also, when when you're going through this in the future, if you want, like, advice on what accommodations to ask for, definitely feel free to re reach on this chat, because there's a lot of things that we didn't even mention that are in here that, like, that could be helpful. Ooh. Ooh. Because I think it's just, like, I don't know, for so long I've always just kind of associated, oh, accommodations, they put you in another room when you get tested, and that, that that's it. So I, I don't know, it's nice hearing people say like, oh, yeah. this or, or this or this. Yeah, definitely. I'm, I really love that was helpful. And I know there's a few that aren't on this list um, for like, I know like anxiety and autism and some other things can give you like some other ones. Like I know a few of my friends have accommodations that like they're allowed to step outside the classroom. Um for like a certain amount of time, like each class, they're just like allowed to go do that. Uh, which most professors would be fine with you doing anyway, but. Yeah, I feel like that one is like, I'm an adult. I should be able to walk yeah. outside if I yes. want to. Some professors get so weird about it. Yeah. Like my geology <laughs> professor was like, hated when like people left to the bathroom like would just like talk shit about it all the time so oh my god my favorite accommodation i have is like a very weird one but it's like i i had an accommodation in high school where like if like i was picked for popcorn reading i could just be like no <laughs> that's <laughs> such a good one so good i because like i i mentioned this in uh general but like i like in middle school i had this awful moment where i was picked for popcorn reading and i read all the sentences in the wrong order and 12 year olds are mean yes. they are so mean i everyone laughed at me it was all, like it's really funny now because i don't care what these 12 year olds think of me in my current day but oh god did that rattle me that rattled me up i'm so glad i didn't have to do that ever again though that reminds me of an accommodation i had before at my old university where i like they gave me accommodations for anxiety and so like I had the ability to opt out of any group assignment and oral presentation in front of the class, and they would just have me write an extra paper instead. That's so well, I would write an extra five-page paper to get out of a group assignment. Honestly, God, it was yeah. awesome. Like, and everyone would go and do their presentations, and I would just be like, not me. It ain't happening. <laughs> <laughs> these are such good accommodations. I wish we had these. <laughs> I oh, thank yeah. you very much for earlier bringing up the idea of um, Texas State looking at other colleges. That is a very good idea. Yeah, that was a really good idea. That I I didn't really think to look at like other colleges' model. I'm really, I'm really glad someone else thought of that because that just went way over my head. Yeah, and like I wonder, like, because I don't know, I wonder what universities like in the United States or even just in Texas like are actually succeeding. Like, yeah. I'm curious to know and like what they're providing because I feel like it's hard to even know what's possible. Like, because yeah. we're not told what's possible, we're like, you know, we have to fight so hard for accommodation. So like, it's it's interesting to think about. Yeah, because we we are actually planning at some point, maybe not this year. Um, like actually talking to ODS about some of these things. Um, so like having like a good prep area is, is a good idea, I think. Yeah, that's a great idea, especially if you could find a model to kind of base off of and like look yeah. at their success rates and stuff. Yeah. Okay. All right. Oh, okay. so well, yeah. If I, I guess if that's that's all we have to say. Um, I some pretty good discussion. I'm I'm really glad everyone everyone who talked talked and thank you everyone for coming and listening.